sponsored by CuriosityStream. Get access to my streaming video service, Nebula, when you sign up at curiositystream.com slash Rene Ritchie. Welcome, first video on the new channel, and I'm next level excited about it. If you missed the trailer, I've left iMore, the company that owned my old channel, Vector, gone indie, and started my own thing. If you like that old channel, I guarantee you, you'll love this new one, but you do have to hit subscribe again, because new channel. So you go ahead and do that, and I'll get us started. Now, the iPhone 11 and iPhone 11 Pro were really well reviewed when they first came out. The iPhone can actually go head to head with the Pixel for low light shooting, bringing out the details while keeping the noise much lower as well. All three of these phones last the full day. That is no need to charge them even if you come to a place like this. It's better than the 10R in every way, but that price went down to $699. There were also some criticisms though. The iPhone 11, however, the non-Pro, still comes with the garbage barely functional 5 watt USB-A to lightning charger. And yes, you can complain about the omission of USB-C and reverse wireless charging and all that kind of stuff. And that really brings me to iOS 13 in general, which is pretty buggy in all of my iPhone review units so far. But times change. Hardware gets worn, software gets updated, new competition comes out, expectations change, and so do circumstances, especially right now, when many of us are rightfully stuck at home and depending on our phones in a very different way than we'd planned to. It makes the whole question of what to buy and when to buy it just like alternate reality different than it was at launch. So I'm gonna do my very first deep dive into all of that, and I'm gonna do it right now. I'm Rene Ritchie, and this is the iPhone 11, six months later iPhone 11 has a beautiful anodized aluminum and glass design. Apple's overall build quality is still among the best in the industry. It's why you see so many old iPhones still out and about, three, four, five or more years on. They're built like little metal and glass bricks. I do like that this year, Apple has used Corning's top of the line glass front and back on the iPhone 11, because last time the iPhone XR didn't get quite as good as the iPhone XS glass on the back. Honestly though, the glass has been a bit of a mixed bag for me. I've said this before, but I don't baby review units. I wanna see how resilient they are, so I throw them in my pocket with keys, with wallets, or when I'm doing a lot of testing with other phones with their big gnarly camera bumps on the back, which are literally the worst things. And I've gotten a lot of scuffs and scratches on my iPhones 11. I can't see them at all when the display is lit up, which is great because it means it doesn't really affect my usage at all. If it did, I'd probably start babying them immediately. I've heard anecdotally that the characteristics of ion exchange glass chemistry can be biased more towards scratch resistance or shatter resistance. In other words, different formulations perform better in one way or the other, never both. If that's accurate, this generation definitely feels biased more towards shatter resistance, at least to me. And I say that as someone who's dropped both the iPhone 11 and the iPhone 11 Pro a bunch of times, never on purpose, and had them all end up totally fine, not a crack on them. So now that Apple's done so well with the shatter, I'd love to see them figure out the scratch, even if it means a sapphire option on the higher end, like the watch has. Because people like me, we need it. There's a beautiful new matte textured finish that looks great and feels awesome in your hand. We've had glossy finishes, we've had frosted finishes now too, but they've all been oh, not zero friction like the Galaxy Flip, but close. A good number of the drops I've had have been because of those slips. So the more Apple can iterate on those finishes to fix that, the better. It has a 6.1 inch liquid retina display. It's a new OLED panel that has two million to one contrast ratio. The LCD display on the iPhone 11 and OLED display on the iPhone 11 Pro remain terrific. I personally prefer the OLED because I'm a sucker for HDR video, and Apple's display team has just done such a terrific job on extending the dynamic range while still mitigating color shift and burn-in, problems that have plagued a lot of other OLED phones over the years. It's something I've come to really appreciate much more lately because stuck at home like many of us are right now, it lets me watch all the glorious high bitrate HDR content, Disney+, Plus, Apple TV+, Plus, even Netflix have been pumping out over the last six months, pretty much anywhere around the house, even out on the balcony. But, and I can't stress this enough, I am a nerd who really appreciates that kind of stuff. Apple's truly excellent color calibration and color management make the LCD displays look eerily close to identical to OLED. 
so close it's hard to tell them apart unless you're comparing them side by side, which given the differences in technologies involved, is absolutely remarkable. You don't get the deep blacks or the peak brightness of the OLEDs with the LCDs, but you also don't get the color shifts and the pulse width modulations, which some people still claim really bothers them. I long ago debunked a lot of the dumb hot takes around <laughs> OMG, not even 1080p, but it's true some people claim they can see the aliasing and don't like watching upscaled 720p or downscaled 1080p videos on their phones. Of course, other people claimed they could see flicker and didn't like at 3x UI downscaling on their 1080p iPhones Plus either. Ultimately, it's about balancing costs and power efficiencies against the limits and quirks of human vision. And right now, with everything that's going on, most streaming services are reducing bit rates and YouTube is defaulting to 480p anyway. The iPhones 11 are still also 60 Hertz and not 120 Hertz ProMotion like the iPads Pro have been since 2017. And an increasing amount of Android phones have gone to over the last year. I've been using a Pixel 4 at 90 Hertz for the last six months as well. And I really like it, though the implementation is a little uncanny compared to the iPad Pros. The Pixel also futzes in and out depending on ambient brightness and Samsung degrades resolution when you enable high frame rate, probably for power efficiency reasons, which makes it easy to see why Apple didn't do it yet with the iPhones 11. So for me, HFR high frame rate is like HDR high dynamic range. Nerds just are going to see it and never want to go back, but most other people won't even care, even if they can notice. And haptic touch in even more places with iOS 13, like contextual menus. I still miss good proper 3D touch. I get that removing it saved some cost and some space and let Apple not only fill up on battery, but provide consistency between long press and force press and across devices like the iPhone and iPad. And haptic touch has gotten more capable, but it's still cognitively slower than 3D touch because you're left waiting for the long press to occur instead of busily creating the force press. I don't know, maybe Apple could do something like Google's just done with Android and use machine learning to try to guess force based on deformation during touch events. In other words, speed up haptic touch response by how fast and how much your fingertip just flattens out against the glass. Basically anything to make haptic touch as quick and physically gratifying to do as 3D touch was. And the glass that surrounds the camera has a sculpted 3D geometry I've said I'd be willing to take a camera bump on a MacBook if it meant getting a really good camera in there. Don't at me. So I'm not going to begrudge the massive units on the iPhones 11, especially now that Google went with something similar and Samsung basically said, hold my case of beers. With an all new wide camera, with a new sensor, with 100% focus pixels for faster autofocus, three times faster in low light. Pretty much everyone agrees it's one of the best still cameras on a phone and arguably still the best video camera on any phone, period. It's also, I think, what makes them useful for mainstream media productions, whether it's just a few shots in a feature film or an entire film. It's similar to how so many pro photographers seem to swear by the iPhone, quality, consistency, and just a killer app ecosystem because of both of those things. Google's latest Pixel 4, which I've also been shooting with for a while now, can capture better stills under some circumstances. It has better segmentation masking for portrait mode, and it just creams the iPhone at digital zoom, something I really hope Apple addresses next the way it addressed night mode previously. The iPhone 11 is still using better camera hardware, better optics, and combining those with the machine stuff like smart HDR in bright conditions, deep fusion indoors and in the mid-range, and night mode when it's dark. But in all cases, it's letting the photos be the photos. Sometimes that's worse, other times it's just quirkier, yet others it's brilliant like you'd expect from a real camera. Every once in a while though, there can be some weird artifacting, and recent software updates really haven't done anything to mitigate it for me. Samsung and Huawei, meanwhile, are using far more massive camera systems now with exponentially more megapixels and binning them down to try and get an average that's better than the sum of the parts. They're also using periscopes, so width can be used instead of depth to shove much better telephotos into their phones. Personally, I just love to see what Apple could do with more megapixels and with pixel binning options at their disposal. You wanna be able to take photos of your pets running around the park or your kids on the playing field of a big game and have them look like your pets, your kids. Nothing goofy and unusable like 100X, but just really solid 10 to 30X. It's one of the basics of real world camera work left for Apple to still conquer. 
All right, let's talk about night mode. Coming from nowhere, Apple caught up with Google, who was the best in the industry just last year. It keeps night looking like dark, moody light. It just reveals the subjects. I like that it's automatic and biases towards instant shutter. The delay on the Pixel 4 still causes me to misjudge shots, a lot. But I do wish you could force it on and that it was faster to force off, just to sometimes get those edge case photos I really want to get. And we have a new ultra wide camera with 120 degree field of view. Optically, it's nowhere nearly as good as the wide angle. It's f2.4 instead of f1.8, so it just can't drink in as much light and suffers from more noise. It's four elements instead of five, so it's not quite as molecularly tack sharp. And it has no focus pixels instead of 100% focus pixels. And because it's so wide, it elongates objects closer to the edges, not like fish eye, but maybe like amphibian eye. I also really like Apple's 1X, 2X, and new 0.5X buttons, which in most cases let you instantly zoom in or out much more elegantly than trying to manually spin a dial interface, especially when you're trying to capture a photo, which, yeah, makes it super weird and frustrating that the 0.5X button seems to stop working once you hit record at 4K60 and then gives you the dial interface instead. Ultimately, I still think the ultra wide angle was a better choice than the telephoto for the iPhone 11. Most of the time, I can sneaker zoom to get closer. Sometimes, especially in lower light, the camera system actually uses the main wide angle for telephoto anyway, because it's still pulling in that exact same data. You can't always go back far enough to capture an ultra wide angle though, especially indoors where many of us are stuck these days. And there's just no way to get that data if you don't capture it. If you're just taking photos in or of your house, you can show the whole room. If you're making TikTok videos, you can show way more of the background or even fit in more of your family or you know, in better times, your friends. Some people might argue that most of this doesn't matter, that many of us are shooting for social media these days, which just absolutely destroys the quality of our images and videos and makes $200 cameras with crushed blacks and boosted sat look as appealing, if not more appealing than $1,000 color accurate cameras on Twitter and Instagram. But those services are slowly, so agonizingly slowly, beginning to introduce higher quality image support. And more importantly, for many of us, these are the only cameras we're using. And a few years or a decade from now, when we look back at the photos and videos we've taken of our families, our children, our pets, our travels, ourselves, we're gonna want those to be the best possible photos and videos they can be. Well, now we're introducing the A13 Bionic, the next generation of our industry leading chip. The A12Z in the latest iPad Pro makes many a PC and Mac cry itself to sleep mode, and this is still next level to that. I've yet to really peg it this side of massive AR scenes, and it even handles complex photo filters and simpler AR scenes with ease, and those were the things that I could use to peg the A11 and A12. And that's fine. Apple's on record saying they're not building chipsets for current performance. They're building them to maintain performance two or three or even four or more years out. And the versions of iOS and apps and maybe peripherals that'll require it. It's also great Apple is putting that chip in not just the iPhone 11 Pro, but the regular iPhone 11 as well. With PCs, it's almost expected that cheaper builds will have worse processors. A lot of phone companies put older or lower performance chips into their less expensive phones. Apple also uses very different chips than its Pro Max versus its standard line. It makes me think that iPhone Premium, while a far worse marketing name, would be a far more accurate name for how Apple is segmenting its lineup. Because in almost every way that really matters, from main camera to processor, you're getting a first class experience with both the iPhone 11 and the iPhone 11 Pro. I do wish there was either more RAM, like the most recent iPads Pro, or better app hibernation. Actually both. Most times, everything is fine. But if you're switching between really heavy apps, like Pokemon Go and Safari and camera, other apps will just jettison from memory, left and right, then have to relaunch or reload completely when you come back, like pre-iOS 4 days. I don't need the ability to pin apps in memories. I don't need one more job. That feels very much like having a mechanic ride around in the car with you. I just need something that better handles the much higher demands apps are putting on the system these days. It'll still have an hour more than battery than in your iPhone XR. Up to four hours longer. It's up to five hours longer in your day. I've run all of them, 11, Pro, Max, right down during Pokemon Go events. And yeah, that remains my absolute favorite way to really stress and low test battery life on phones. 
and they've all lasted just hours and hours, even with constant display at full brightness, GPS, data, graphics rendering, everything. Battery health on the 11 and the 11 Max is still 100%. The 11 Pro, which I use roughly twice as much as the other two, is still at 98%, and that's after months and months of daily abuse. Staying at home all day, you'd think plugs and pads would be just plentiful, and I'd always be topping up, but I really just don't wanna to have to even think about it. So the longer it lasts between charges, the better. When I do charge, the new USB-C cord and USB-C adapter, are aces. So much so, I really wish Apple would include them with the iPhone 11 as well, not just the iPhone 11 Pro as in premium. Now we want to give you a sneak peek of a new feature coming in the camera that will be available with a software update this fall, but it's so cool we have to tell you about it. We're at iOS 13.4 already, when some years we don't get much past point two, and frankly, it was necessary. Where iOS 12 was one of the most stable releases I can remember in a long time, from beta to final bug fix, iOS 13 was a hot mess in beta and not much better at launch. It is better now though. There are still some bugs, old and new, but for the most part, it's finally smooth and solid. And in the meantime, Apple's also delivered new features like Deep Fusion for more detailed photos and indoor lighting, and new emoji and Memoji, because those are the things that actual people actually care about. And of course, cursor support for the iPad, which I kind of wish was on the iPhone now as well, especially because the iPhone is just so overpowered, but so screen constrained. A cursor and a trackpad, especially with AirPlay, could just unlock a lot of utility for people, especially for people locked at home. Same with multi-windowing and picture-in-picture. -picture. I know Apple wants to keep things simple on the small display, but I so often wish I could take notes while surfing the web, type messages while watching video, all of that kind of stuff, the stuff I do on the iPad. I know Android already does this as well. The operating systems started off on opposite ends of the spectrum, but are converging on a similar feature and interface set. They just have very different points of view and are very differently problematic. This though is something I think Apple could do really, really well. I asked all of you on Twitter what you thought about the iPhone 11 six months later, and a ton of you responded. I'll link the whole thread in the description, but it was pretty much exactly what I went over here. Great camera, great battery, and for the baseline model, great price. So this is our lineup of three new iPhones starting at $699, $999, and $1099. Hell, in an age where Samsung has just blown past the 1000 mark and never looked back, never mind the foldables, which are fun, but as resilient as doilies, even the iPhone 11 Pro doesn't look quite as stratospherically priced anymore. But I've been saying for a long time now, it isn't about price, it's about value, what it delivers to you for that price. And with the iPhone 11 models, Apple's just delivering a ton of value, especially when you factor in all the free software, really free, not just free as in privacy and data that comes with them. Normally, six months later, I throw in some caution as well, that new models will be arriving like clockwork in just another six months. And while we might get a new lower cost home button iPhone update soon, there's just no way to tell when or how anything else will play out this year, even with Apple's typically rock solid release schedule. So I'll just remind you again, that while the tech universe is obsessed with year over year upgrades, unless you're on an annual plan, most people just don't think that way. Most people keep a phone for two, increasingly three or four years, and typically only upgrade when they have to. But Having new iPhones every year means any year you choose to upgrade guarantees you'll get the best iPhone possible that year, one that can see you through another two, three, four more years. And that's exactly the case here. If you have an iPhone 6 or 6S, an iPhone 7, even 8, then the iPhone 11 remains an absolutely terrific update. And since iPhones keep their value better than pretty much any other phone in the industry, whether you're trading in, handing down, or selling so you can trade up, you can likely save some cash not only on your next iPhone, but by rinse and repeating the same process with every subsequent iPhone you get. Especially if you want or need that new iPhone now, because you're working from home or just stuck at home. The cameras are great for getting creative indoors even when you can't go out. The battery life lasts all day, even at your kitchen counter or on the sofa. And the price, especially for the iPhone 11 proper, is just all shades of right. And that's true even if you just wanna sit around between con calls and watch money. Tom Scott's new original game show on Nebula. I invited five people to play some games. 
I trust no one. None of us are trustworthy. In an environment designed to slowly break their team apart. This is real money. But all they knew is they'd be sat round a table trying to win real cash. $10,000. Just brutal. And it's exclusive to Nebula, the streaming video platform I'm building along with other independent creators. People like Legal Eagle, Low Spec Gamer, Sarah Z, Lindsay Ellis, and so many more. We're building it because we really want a place where creators can try out new content ideas. One that just might not work on YouTube, where you're forced pretty much by the algorithm to stay in your content lane. Or for people who simply don't want to watch on YouTube. I'm working my way through Thomas Frank's back catalog right now. I mean, it's not procrastinating if you're watching videos about how to avoid procrastination, right? And because Nebula comes bundled with CuriosityStream, you also get access to thousands of documentaries and series, all for just $19.99 a year. A year. And you won't just be helping me out, but the entire educational community as we work together to build a place where we can create the content you really want us to create. Go to curiositystream.com slash Renee Ritchie for unlimited access to the world's top documentaries and nonfiction series. And now Nebula as well. Enter the promo code Renee Ritchie to start your membership absolutely free for the first 31 days. Thanks CuriosityStream and thanks to all of you for your support. So that's my re-review of the iPhone 11 some six months later. Now I want to hear from you. If you've been using an iPhone 11 or iPhone 11 Pro for a while now, how's it holding up for you? What do you love about it and what do you hate? How has it helped or hindered you while you're working from home? And if you're still considering it, what's tempting you and what's holding you back? Hit that subscribe button if you haven't already and then hit up the comments and let me know. Thanks for watching. See you next video.